going to talk about co-products, which are the dual of products. What does the dual mean? It means that you're doing the entire same thing in the opposite category. And because we've done products already, we understand completely, that means that we already understand co-products, so there's nothing left to say. Oh, all right, I'll say something. Um, we're going to turn around this definition of a product. Remember that a product of A and B is an object equipped with projection maps like this, such that, here's the universal property, such that given any object equipped with morphisms like that, there's a unique factorization. So now, to take the dual of this, we're literally going to turn around every arrow in this diagram. Okay, off we go. So, let's turn around like this. So that's the definition of a co-product. It's, it's an object U. This is still going to be the universal one down here. U is for universal. So it's an object U equipped with maps P and Q going into it such that given any other diagram of the same shape, that is an object V equipped with maps going into it, there is a unique factorization and that has to change direction as well. So now the unique factorization goes from U to V. Uh, a little point of terminology, when these were projection maps for the product, we called them projection maps. Hmm, should I try that sentence again? For the product, they went this, this way around, and we called them projection maps because of the analogy with uh, Cartesian products, because they projected onto the first component and onto the second component. Now they're going this way around, we're going to see that they're insertion maps, because they insert a into the co-product and it ins this one inserts B into the co-product. Um, so let's immediately have a look at sets because those are the things that uh, perhaps we understand the best and you might think to yourself, hmm, I wonder what these are in sets. So I hope that you might have guessed by now or worked it out because we're all very clever around here. Uh, and that is that they're going to be disjoint unions. So let's just have a little look at how disjoint union is a co-product in set. So first of all, we certainly do have canonical insertion maps. A sits inside the disjoint union of A and B in a completely canonical way, and B sits inside the disjoint union of A and B. That's why they're called insertion maps. Each element here just goes to the copy of itself in the disjoint union. Now, supposing we had another set and, uh, and maps like that, well, could we construct a map like this, and if so, would it be unique? So if we've got an F here and a G here, we do the same thought experiment that we did on the products, which is that uh, we've got to think about where everything would go here, given that we know A has to go to F of A and B has to go to, to G of B in there. So how do we define, If just think about ordinary disjoint unions, how do we define a function from the disjoint union to somewhere else? But well, we just have to decide where everything in A goes and where everything in B goes. Now, where could everything in A possibly go? If we take a little, little A in here, where's it going to go? Well, if it was an A starting from down here, then we know that it would have to go to F of A, right? And now this little A down here just gets mapped into its copy of itself in here. So this little A simply has to go to F of A. It's the only place it can go. And what about if it were a B? Because everything in here is either in A or in B, just one or the other, right? So if it was a little B, where would this little B go from down here? Well, it would just go to G of B because that's what G does. So we know that this little B gets inserted into here and just hits its own image of itself. And so this little b just has to go to g of b up there. And so we can define a map on the disjoint union to be on the elements of a, it goes to f of a, and on the elements of b, it goes to g of b. That's the only possible thing it could have been. It makes everything commute, it's unique. That shows that this is, this is a, a co-product of a and b. Now, we can do all the same things that we did with products. We've got uniqueness up to unique isomorphism, just as before. And remember, it means that if we've got another co-product, there's got to be a unique isomorphism between them making the entire diagram commute. Um, what else is true? We've also we've got the same issue that B disjoint union A is another co-product, so we can switch those round. Um, and we've got a whole load of examples in all the places that we just had before. So let's 
Let's talk about those. Should I leave that there? Should I leave that there? Nah. Um, okay, so what have we got? In the category of topological spaces, we've just got disjoint union. Uh, in the category of groups, we have given A and B, we've got the free product A star B. And it is, I think you'll agree, slightly frustrating that this is called a kind of product, even though it's a kind of co-product. Um, but oh well, you think of it as a sort of disjoint union. It's the best you can do as a disjoint union. Because of course, if you take the disjoint union of two groups, then it won't necessarily be a group. Because if you just shove the elements together, you won't actually have um, be able to multiply an element from this thing with an element from this thing. So then you have to generate something freely like mad. Um, and that's what gives you the free product. So when you're trying to work out what a co-product is, you can often try and take a disjoint union and then do the closest thing possible to taking a disjoint union if the disjoint union fails. Um, right, so we've also got abelian groups and vector spaces. And here, it's direct sum, which, as we saw before, was also the product. It's, again, you can think of it, it's almost a bit more obvious that this is a co-product, I think, than a product. That's my personal opinion, anyway. Because how you take a direct sum of vector spaces, you kind of take the disjoint union of them, and then you go, oh dear, I need to be able to add them all together with each other if you take this one and this one and stick them together. So again, you're taking the disjoint union and then you're doing everything necessary to make it to make it actually into an, um, uh, an, object, of vector, uh, an object of this category. Um, uh, what else did we have? Oh yes, we had if x is a poset, last time we had that products were greatest lower bounds, imps, um, and it shouldn't come as any surprise to you that now we've taken the dual concept, we've got everything the other way around. So in a poset, um, x is a poset in, my grammar's gone completely up the spout, in x, comma, a poset, oh, I don't know, a disjoint union, no, co-product is, well, this time it's going to be a soup that is, least upper bound, otherwise known as um, uh, uh, this way around, which is called join. So again, we've got time to say this. No, probably not, but never mind. You've got to think about it being, we've got maps going in this direction now. So the co-product is going to be some object that's bigger than x and y, and it's going to be the best possible bigger one. So it's not going to be a very, very bigger one. It's going to be the, the closest bigger one that you've got. So that's the least bigger one. That is the least upper bound. Um, um, uh, what's I going to say? Oh, yeah. A quite interesting example is if you take base topological spaces rather than just spaces, then what you get is the uh, wedge. So remember that a wedge is, say, uh, if you take a, a space with a base point and you wedge it to another space with a base point, you kind of take the disjoint union except that these two base points have to get identified with each other. So you stick them together on their base point. So again, what you're doing here is you're taking the disjoint union, but then you're fiddling around with it to, to, to rectify the fact that you haven't got what you wanted. So if you just take the disjoint union of two base spaces, then you have an issue because now you've got two base points. So you correct this issue by identifying the two base points, and that's what that's what the co-product is in this case. So the moral of that story is that the universal property is telling you that you're somehow the best among all things, which might mean the biggest or the smallest or um, somehow canonical. It's the, the obvious one. It's the one where you don't have to make any choices because it's the biggest. Um, and we'll see eventually that all universal properties can be thought of like that.